tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations. With two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about dire discoveries and shattering shopping trips. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Marta Abromayatite and Mike Mann is Jeff Sturdivant, myself, Paul J. McSorley, and Kevin Barbary. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Marta Abromaya Tite and performed by Jeff Sturdivant and myself, Paul J. McSorley. This tale comes from the book Plastic Faces, which is available for purchase with our friends over at Valox. Now, without further ado, I present to you The Lost City. When I decided to move to the countryside, I thought it would be the best thing for my mental health. I recently went through a bit of a sticky divorce. Ex-wife got custody of the kids and somehow our mutually owned house. I was in a bad place for a long time. Contemplated taking my own life. The whole shebang. I decided to see a therapist and long story short... It was advised and eventually decided that I move away for a while. Move somewhere quiet, empty, and nondescript. The countryside would be the perfect place, right? At least I thought so, anyway. At first. I spent days scouring the housing market, looking for anything that would bring me a little bit of peace. Finally, I found a beautiful Victorian house the next town over. A rustic little place. It was the description of the surrounding area and the house itself that really sold it for me. The small house was situated on the outskirts of an inviting and picturesque forest. Nature galore. The house itself looked somewhat old but had a modern feel to it. Weather-worn, white bricks then held old memories but could still manifest new ones. From the pictures, you could tell it had recently been painted. I was elated. It took me a few days to gather and pack up the remaining few possessions I had, and it wasn't long until I arrived at the new house. Now, I won't say the house looked exactly like it did in the pictures, but they never really do, do they? It looked a bit more beat up on closer inspection and the whiteness of the place no longer had the same allure. The surrounding forest was overgrown and looked somewhat menacing. Looked suffocating. Like if you walked in, the shabby leaves and lumbering trees would swallow you whole. In other words, it didn't look inviting. I tried to kick the pesky thoughts away. I was here, and I was finally alone. That's basically what the doctor ordered, 
so I did my best to forget the strangeness of the place. Place it in the back of my mind, like a soon-to-be-forgotten memory. But I couldn't rid myself of the uneasy feeling that washed over me as I walked closer to the house. I couldn't pinpoint what it was that made me feel that way either. It was like a persisting itch that you just couldn't scratch. The inside of the house was a little different from the pictures, too, and not what I imagined it would be. Layers of dust covered every single nook and cranny, like it hadn't been touched by a duster for years. It was dark, too. Too dark for a summer's afternoon. It was as if the house itself devoured all the light that entered it. The furniture looked extremely dated. There were chairs, sofas, and tables that I had never seen before. They were all oddly shaped, too. Crooked and warped. It didn't look like it belonged there, and it made me feel uncomfortable. Where did it come from? I'd think to myself. I certainly wasn't going to keep it. I ended up throwing them out. I didn't realize then what a mistake that would be. You shouldn't touch things that aren't yours. I settled in quickly and focusing on myself was my new priority. I wanted to get better with the hopes that I'd get to see my kids again. The first few days flew by with no incident. I read, took long walks, and was generally being a Zen king. I started hearing noises at the end of that first week. It was little things at first. Things that could have been blamed on the fact that it was an old house. It's common knowledge that old houses just exhume strange sounds, right? Floorboards creaking, noisy pipes, that sort of thing. The strange thing was, the sounds that I was hearing seemed to be coming from underneath the house. The sounds are quite hard to describe, and if I'm honest, quite mundane. Well, they were at first, anyway. It was this intermittent scratching, as if someone was scraping long, calcified nails against hardwood. And that's all it was. Every night at two or three in the morning, I'd hear it. It would last for an hour and then slowly cease. I tried to ignore it as best I could. It didn't really bother me so much at first anyway. After a while, it just became part of life. Unfortunately, it got worse. So much worse. A few weeks later, I woke up one night engulfed in sweat. I felt frightened and so utterly alone. The silence in the house was eerie and suffocating. It took me a few moments to recover, and that was when I started to hear the scratching again. Only this time, it was accompanied by something else. It sounded like someone clicking their tongue a horrible wet noise traveled up from underneath the house, reverberating off the walls in my room. The scratching grew louder and louder, to the point where I could bear it no longer. I got out of bed and followed the sound, followed it all the way down into the basement. It was strongest here, almost filling the room, it was concentrated on one spot on the floor, which was covered by a carpet. With one brisk motion, I tossed the carpet aside and saw that underneath it was a boarded-up wooden door. I've watched enough horror films to know that you absolutely shouldn't investigate weird shit that you hear in your house, but in this instance, I was so intrigued by the door drawn to it, I guess. I was desperate to find out what was behind it. Maybe it was the explorer in me, or maybe I was just itching for something different to happen to me. Something that would finally make me feel alive. Whatever it was, 
that made me pull up the boards on that door. I stood outside the door for what felt like hours before I finally managed to pluck up the courage to open it. Cold, brisk air assaulted my face, followed by the foulest smell I ever had the displeasure of inhaling in my whole life. My nostrils flared, and I had to stifle the chicken curry I had for my dinner that was threatening to come back up and decorate the basement floor. It's difficult to describe this stench. Have you ever smelled gangrenous flesh? I have, and that's basically what it smelled like down there. This sweet yet sharp smell emanated from within the opening. My eyes watered, and I had to swallow the bile that traveled up my throat. When the smell passed, or maybe I had just grown accustomed to it, I saw some stairs. You'd think after encountering the smell of literal death, I wouldn't even dream of taking a step further. But you're probably smarter than me. I was just too interested. A thought had occurred to me then. Maybe that's why the place was so cheap. Because the previous tenant was a homicidal maniac that had left some rotting corpses down there. Either way, I couldn't live with this shit. And now that the rabbit hole had been unearthed, I had to explore it. I descended the stairs, and when I got to the bottom, I saw I was in a stupendously large cave. It looked like some post-war underground facility. It was darker than dark down there, but I could see a faint glimmer of light up ahead. The curiosity within me took over the fear that was brewing, and I began walking toward the light. When I reached it, I realized it was a torch. Two torches, to be precise. They were placed on either side of a small, decrepit sign. The City of Cardath. Now, my first thoughts were generally a mixture of what the fucks and this is impossibles, it was the sort of sign that you'd see when entering small villages, wooden and hand-painted, if you were entering a village in a fucking Grimm's fairy tale story. Everything about it looked old, too. I stood staring at it, utterly stupefied. This had to be some sort of joke. There was no way that there was ever a city here. I was torn away from my bizarre thoughts by a loud clicking of a tongue. I looked up and attempted to see into the darkness. The sounds were coming from deeper within the cave. I don't know why I continued further, but I did. I took one of the torches from above me and followed the sound. As I walked deeper, I realized I was in an actual city. Large, derelict houses and buildings surrounded me. There was rubble everywhere, as if the city had been ravaged by war. It smelt of singed hair and burnt flesh, and I could feel the sorrow that afflicted the place. Echoes of the torment that occurred here pierced my heart. Everything looked ancient here, prehistoric even. The scorched buildings were not the structure of modern times. They were incredibly tall to start with, but they protruded at impossible angles. And if you looked at them for too long, the shape would warp and change. I averted my eyes and continued walking. That was when I noticed all the strange symbols that were painted on each intact wall. It was an eye painted in a deep, menacing black, with crimson arrows pointing in and out in various directions. I don't consider myself a deeply religious person, but you don't need to be to figure out that something occult happened here. The fear that had settled in the deep recesses of my stomach was threatening to engulf me like a rogue wave. I couldn't take my eyes off the symbols, 
but the same tongue-clicking sound reached my ears once more. But this time, it sounded like it was coming from right behind me. I turned around and saw what I think was a deathly pale, veiny leg dashing behind one of the derelict houses. My blood turned to ice, and I'm pretty sure my heart stopped beating right then and there. I held my breath and decided to get the fuck out. I didn't know what was down there, and I sure as hell didn't want to stay and find out. I'd seen enough. I headed back the way I came, but that was when I noticed something different. There were people standing in the doorway of each building and house. At least I thought they were people. They didn't look anything like you or me. They were impossibly tall, with long, gangly arms. Their bodies were bulbous and cut up crudely. I realized then where the gangrene smell was coming from. Their skin was discolored with shades of blue and purple, and I could see swollen, putrefying blisters full of brown fluid that had formed on their skin, many of which were oozing. They all stared at me, their eyes glowing like pale moons, and what terrified me most was how ravenous each one of them looked. One of them was holding a bundle of something small in its pus-covered arms. It noticed that I was looking, and it extended its arms, and I vomited when I saw what was inside. I think it was a baby, but it was so deformed you could no longer tell. Its head was misshapen, like it had been gripped with a pair of forceps and forcefully pulled out of its mother's womb. Its eyes were little blood-filled slits, barely open, and it was sucking a blackened finger. I found myself crying. I couldn't bear what I was seeing any longer. I needed to get out. I averted my eyes, and that was when I saw the gnarled fingers of those grotesque beings pointing at something behind me. I turned around slowly and saw a monstrous statue. At least I thought it was a statue until it moved. It stirred and pulsated like a heartbeat. It was adorned by torsos and various crimson-colored body parts. It opened its mouth, and these stifled grunts escaped, to which the people of Cardath responded with their own pained groans. Then they all opened their mouths, and I saw they had no tongues. All had been either ripped out or cut out. I screamed. The human mind can only take so much before it finally crumbles, and I think mine was on the verge of disintegrating, as if a bomb was about to go off inside my head. I dropped the torch and ran. I ran as fast as my legs could take me. I was submerged in darkness, but at this point, I really didn't care. I just needed to get out of this bizarre and terrifying world. As I was running, I heard this piercing scream behind me and hundreds of feet hitting concrete, like they were all chasing me. I think they were. I managed to make it back to my basement. I boarded the door and put anything heavy that I could find on top. I wanted to keep whatever it was inside. Occasionally, I heard pounding, scratching, and a baby crying. I tried my best to ignore the sounds, but now that they'd seen there was a way out, I didn't know how long I'd be able to keep them all inside. I didn't move out. I really couldn't tell you why. I think I felt responsible somehow. I should have never opened that door and I should have never gone down there. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had found. 
The stench and sight of death was forever imprinted on my fragile mind. I was determined to find out as much as I could about the city of Cardath. I knew there was more at play here, more that could be unearthed. I had gone where no human being had ever gone before, and I could never go back from that. One thing I did know, the people of Cardath were restless. They tasted freedom, and they wanted out. Living above a lost city certainly had its downsides, and as soon as I discovered the city of Cardath, I made it my mission to uncover what happened to its people. I frequented libraries, scoured old newspapers, and combed the internet to find anything I could about the decimated city. As you can imagine, I had no luck. There was no information about the city anywhere. It was as if it never existed. Pretty soon, I started to doubt everything I saw there. Maybe it was some sort of blip in my psyche. A momentary loss in cognitive function. Of course, I knew it wasn't. But either way, I tried my best to put it from my mind. But my obsession lingered like a bad smell and was only heightened every time I stepped foot in that treacherous basement. The sounds, they never stopped. I would hear them almost daily. The scratching and the tongue clicking would start in the night and would continue until the next morning. It drove me out of my mind. The things I saw down there haunted me as I slept. The mutilated bodies of the residents frequented my thoughts. The one thing that lingered and endured in my mind was one question. What happened to the people of Cardath? I needed to find out. But to find out, I would need to go back. I had to put my expedition on hold when my ex-wife called to say that my son Noah was desperate to see me. He missed me, she said. He needed to see his father, and whatever issues we were facing, we needed to put them aside in order to keep our children happy. There was no need to stir the hornet's nest, as they say, so I complied. My son Noah arrived a few days later, elated to see me, of course, and we spent a few days enjoying each other's company. The city of Cardath was shifted to the back of my mind. For a while, I forgot all about it. The strange thing was, though, while my son was visiting, the sounds never once resurfaced. It was as if they knew I was no longer alone. To be honest, I was just happy to have a moment's peace, that's one thing I haven't been able to have ever since I moved down here. Which was ironic, really, when you think about it. Right? That was the whole reason I bought the wretched place. One late evening, the night before Noah was due to go back to his mother's, we had decided to play a game of hide-and-seek. Noah was an inquisitive child, and despite the small house, I knew he'd find a way to have fun with the game. Before we began, I took Noah aside and explicitly told him not to go in the basement. But why, Daddy? He asked me, his little eyes welling up. Because the basement is no place for a little boy, Noah, I said, stroking his hair. He nodded, albeit solemnly, but I had hoped that my stern tone would deter him from going down there. Children are also notoriously afraid of basements, aren't they? My basement warranted that fear. However, my son did what you would expect. He did the complete opposite. The house wasn't that big, as I mentioned, so when I couldn't find Noah, panic rose in my throat like bile. My thoughts raced, 
crashing and tearing at each other like wild animals. I ran around the house like a loose cannon, throwing and crashing the furniture in my terror. I shouted for Noah. I screamed his name. But my worst fears were realized when I saw the basement door. It was open. A cold breeze licked at my bare feet. When I walked down there, I saw that the door into the abyss was open too. I didn't know how he'd managed to move everything I'd placed on top. The furniture had been thrown aside. I walked gingerly toward it, my throat dry and crackly, lacking moisture. I felt fear, but mixed in that fear was anger. Why do kids never listen? I cursed Noah's inquisitive little mind. As I stepped foot into that dark, damp basement, all the memories of my encounter flooded back like a wave, and I found myself trembling like a lost puppy. I knew I would have to go inside, and as that thought sunk in, I realized just how badly I didn't want to. But my son... Noah. I had to save him. I followed the stairs down just as I had before, and I was shrouded in darkness once more. I went toward the city. I felt as if my heart was being squeezed with a mighty hand. I faltered just outside the sign, the torches blaring with life. I wished then that their fire would somehow ignite some courage within me. I called his name, my voice meek and silent. Noah? There was no answer, just an overpowering and foreboding stillness. I took a deep breath, lifted a torch, and proceeded on. A faint child's laugh reached my ears as I did so. I stopped to listen, but I could hear no more. The architecture of Cardath City surrounded me once more, the buildings and houses much the same as I'd remembered them. I couldn't see any signs of life, though, but I knew that they were there somewhere, hiding and biding their time. Something seemed different, though. The deadness of the city and its people felt less absolute. The destitute I had felt before had faltered. As I searched for Noah, I saw a small fire and the silhouette of a man. Feeling hopeless, I approached him. As if sensing my presence, he whipped around, and I recoiled at the sight of him. His skin was charred, ravaged by an inferno. He looked like he had literally climbed out of hell. One of his eyes was half-closed, nothing but a slit. His other eye stared deep into my soul. I had to avert my eyes. He wore nothing but ragged sheets over his frail frame. Much of his exposed skin was covered in a plethora of infected blisters and pus-filled boils. I tried to feel pity, but the disgust I felt couldn't be concealed. The repugnant smell that permeated from this man is indescribable. A mixture of rotting flesh and dead tissue. That gangrenous smell I'd described before. He opened his mouth to speak, and I saw that his tongue was still intact, unlike the other residents of this devastated city. Who are you, and what are you doing here? He asked. I felt almost accused. I... I'm lo looking for my son. Have you seen him? I replied. There are many children here he said, turning his gaze back to the blazing flames in front of him. He's a little boy, blonde, green-eyed, 
doesn't belong here. Please, I have to find him, I said sternly. I have seen no such child, he said. You shouldn't be here. He's here somewhere. He must be. Please, can you help me find him? I asked, the terror that dogged my voice painfully apparent. The man turned to look at me then. Do you want to know what happened here? Without thinking, I replied. Yes. Then sit, he said sternly. I sat without complaint. Something within me stirred. That same curiosity that had first called me down here. As ashamed as I am to admit this, all thoughts of my son Noah faded to the back of my mind. I knew this wasn't me. I loved my son with all my heart. It was this place. This man. I was bewitched. He began. Long ago, this city was prosperous. Its people full of life, full of dreams and hopes. The people of Karadath were simple, never yearning for much. We had crops, our population was growing steadily, and we weren't afflicted with diseases, unlike the other cities that were around at the time. I guess we were just lucky, he said. Or we were lucky until the stranger came. The stranger? I asked. He was a man from a different time, a different world to ours. Although we didn't know at the time, or maybe we just didn't care to know. With him, he brought death and destruction. He pillaged each person here. I was luckier than most, but you wouldn't think that by looking at me. What happened? I asked. It was all my fault, really. Maybe that's why I was left somewhat unscathed, my tongue and own free will still intact. So that I can always remember what happened here. I am forced to look at my beloved city every day. Forced to watch how it has warped and changed. And forced to look at what my deeds have done to the people here. You see, when this stranger came, he promised us things. Promised me things. I was mayor at the time, and I was greedy. The stranger took advantage of that. He told me I could have everything I ever wanted. He said that our city and people will flourish. We just had to do a few things. What things? I asked. Out of the corner of my eye, I glimpsed the residents of Cardath City gathering, clicking their teeth. He told us it wouldn't be much. All we had to do was accept his god. We weren't religious people, you understand. So it wasn't difficult to accept some unknown god in order to help our city flourish. It was a small sacrifice, I had thought. I didn't know that it would destroy our whole city. I didn't know it would mean that my people had to suffer unimaginable torment. I didn't know. We prepared for the ritual the stranger had set for us. It was simple, really. We had to draw these symbols all over our buildings, and then we had to build a fire and gather around it with the stranger in the middle. When we were all prepared, the stranger began chanting in a language that none of us had ever heard before. It was a most peculiar guttural noise, like... He was speaking with his throat. Do you know what I mean? I nodded, unable to speak. We were all so clueless, so utterly gullible. We smiled as the stranger's body unraveled like a Christmas present. 
From within him rose the most mortifying creature. It declared with its many mouths that the city of Cardiff was now his and we belonged to him. He then proceeded to tear everyone apart, women, children, anyone and everyone. A lot of the residents didn't come out of fear, and so a lot were hiding in their homes, but the stranger found them and savaged them too. This city has been a wasteland ever since. Its people empty shells, feeding on themselves and each other. There is no humanity left here, until you came along, of course. Now you have opened the door. You have shown them there is a way out. More importantly, you have shown the stranger that there are more souls, more cities for it to consume. You shouldn't have come down here. He bared his teeth at me, and at that moment, I heard a scream. The scream of a child. My child. It was Noah. The screams of Noah reverberated across the ravaged city. His anguished cries piercing my heart like a lead bullet. I looked around frantically, desperately trying to find him, but he was nowhere in sight. I looked back at the man. The mayor and he too had disappeared. Noah! I screamed. The residents of Cardath City had retreated back to whatever corner of hell they had derived from, and I was left completely alone. Alone and terrified, with terrible thoughts swirling around in my head. I saw Noah, his skin hanging off him like kebab meat. Long, bloody strips of flesh dripping crimson. I saw Noah being devoured by the residents of Cardath with their charred hands deep inside his stomach, pulling out his intestines and sucking on them like lollipop sticks. The images that plagued my mind were unrelenting. I heard anguished cries coming at me from all directions. I could no longer tell who or what they belonged to. One thing I knew for certain, I had to find Noah and get out of there. I no longer cared about anything else, and I knew this city had to be destroyed. Burnt to the ground, along with every macabre thing in it. As soon as I found Noah, I had to find Noah first. I tried to go in the direction I thought the screams had derived from, but in a city completely adorned by rubble, it was hard to know which direction was the right one. I followed my gut nonetheless and found myself back by the wall with the bizarre scriptures. The swirling patterns followed me as I made my way across, dirt sticking to my socks. I tried to be as quiet as I possibly could, as I had the overwhelming feeling that someone or something was watching me. I could feel eyes burning into the back of my head but every time I turned around, there would be nothing there. Just darkness and death. It was eerily silent. You could have heard a pin drop, should a pin have dropped anywhere. I felt uneasy. Vulnerable. I passed the scorched buildings in a blur. Everything was beginning to look the same, and I couldn't discern where I was anymore. I felt like I'd gone in circles. I knew I'd walked for about two hours without encountering a single living or dead soul. I was beginning to lose hope that I'd ever find Noah, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw something. A small but bright fire, one that I was sure wasn't there before. I hobbled toward it feeling the tiredness in my legs. As I got nearer, I noticed that the fire wasn't a fire at all. It was a heart, a burning heart, and it was pulsating. 
As I got even closer, I saw that it was surrounded by something, and as my eyes adjusted, I saw a circle of bodies. The bodies were strewn, but they had a kind of pattern to how they were laid out. Each person lay contorted with their arms and legs twisted in directions I care not to describe. But curiously, they were all connected by their fingers. A slight gracing of the fingertips is what tethered them together. It was a truly grotesque sight, seeing them all arranged like that. Their faces distorted, so twisted, it made me think of a wrung out cloth. I didn't get any closer but as if sensing my presence, the heart sprung to life, beating wildly. I don't know what it was, but something drew me even closer, and before I knew it, I was leaning over the heart, staring deep into its center. I was hypnotized and enthralled by the swirling pattern. It seemed to almost move in a snake-like fashion slithering to and fro. Then suddenly, it ripped open to reveal a crimson-colored eye. I jumped, falling backwards onto the bodies. The heart beat even faster, and the eye looked around frantically before fixing its gaze on me. The fire heart burned even brighter, and that was when I saw veins veins that went deep into the earth like the tendrils of a jellyfish. I looked up and I saw the ground. It lit up. The veins of this heart transversed the whole city. Then the corpses began to stir. It was little things at first. The twitch of an eyelid, the unfurling of a lip, but it was noticeable horrifyingly so. Then they all started to get up. Their eyes were as white as milk, and their mutilated bodies contorted robotically. They looked like deformed string puppets, their movements controlled by someone other than themselves. I stood motionless, unable to move a muscle. They all turned to look at me, and I realized then that I was trapped. They encircled me. I saw something behind one of their heads. It was a man, silhouetted by the darkness. As the light from the tendrils of the beating heart hit his face, I realized it was the mayor. He was smiling. Please, help me, I said. I examined him. He looked different than he had a mere few hours ago. His ragged clothing had been replaced. He now wore a long black cloak that obscured most of his body. As I stared, dumbfounded, he opened it. Inside were thousands and thousands of little maggots, all swirling and writhing across his charred flesh, but they moved with a purpose could see that much. I saw that they were squirming over an outline of a small body. A child's body. It was Noah. As soon as I saw my son's small meager body revealed, I tried to run to him, but the reanimated corpses of the residents blocked my path. One of them grabbed me by the arm pulled it so hard that I thought it was going to be pulled out of its socket. I screamed. I fought. I kicked. I did everything I could to get myself away from them. To get to my son. Then I saw something glisten on the ground. A hammer. I don't know where it had come from, but I was certain it wasn't there before. I managed to free myself from their deathly grip, ducked down and picked up the hammer. Then I swung with all my might. 
The first face I hit exploded. Blood and viscera flew in all directions. I swung and swung, almost without looking, and was assaulted by a constant wave of blood. I ran toward the mayor and Noah. I must have resembled a madman, but I didn't care. All I saw was red. As I approached the mayor and Noah, I saw hundreds of Cardath City residents approaching from either side. All were hungry for my son. All were reaching for him. Noah represented new life. A life they desperately yearned for. He was a fledgling, surrounded by predators that wanted to devour him. And I was running out of time to save him. It's no use. Your son is ours. The words of the mayor sent a chill down my bruised spine. Let him go, I shouted. His life will release us, said the mayor. It is time, he said, turning his gaze toward the residence. I don't know what made me do what I did but I turned around as fast as I could and ran back toward the circle, toward the heart. With what strength I had left, I swung the hammer down on the heart, hard. I hit it until there was nothing left, until it was nothing but a fleshy smear on the floor. The ground beneath me began to shake, and as I turned to look behind me, I saw that the residents, and more importantly, the mayor, were all writhing on the floor. They screamed. Blood flowed from their ears, eyes, and mouths. I grabbed Noah and got the hell out of there. I ran and ran until I could no longer hear them. Once I reached the stairs back up into my basement, I heard something from deep within the cavern. A deep, guttural growl. I moved out of that house the next day. But before I did, I made sure to seal the door to that hellish place using every single bit of wood I could find. I didn't want anyone else to go down there. Didn't want anyone else to experience what I had experienced. Noah had to have therapy after his encounter with Cardath City. He wouldn't speak, wouldn't sleep, and had terrible night terrors. My wife wouldn't let me see him, and I struggled to explain everything that he and I saw. No one believed me. I miss him terribly, and not a day goes by where I don't blame myself for what happened. If only I'd left well enough alone, things wouldn't have turned out this way. I live in a block of flats now, on the highest floor, trying to forget the lost city of Cardath. Desperately wanting to forget the terrifying, animalistic growl that I heard down there before Noah and I escaped. I don't know what it was, and I pray every day that I don't ever find out. If you ever discover a lost city underneath your house, I beg you, don't go exploring. I hope you enjoyed The Lost City, as written by Marta Abromayatite, and performed by Jeff Sturdivant and myself, Paul J. McSorley. Marta is a contributing writer for Vice UK, Screen Rant, and Rubla, an avid fan of horror and science fiction, lover of books, in particular fantasy, science fiction, and horror, but also likes the occasional classic. She loves writing short stories and opinion pieces on all things related to film. Our second tale of the evening is written by Mike Mann and performed by Kevin Barbary. In it, we meet a guy who goes out to buy groceries. 
he finds himself dealing with a number of other customers whose attitudes rub him completely the wrong way. Now, without further ado, I present to you Shopping on a Budget. I don't know if this will catch anyone's attention or will ever be read, but I'm gonna just let it all out. Not looking for advice or using this as a cry for help, I guess I'm utilizing the internet as a way to vent about today's events. I'm not a fan of people and I can't stand being in public. There is no way I would discuss this in person with anyone, but behind my computer screen seems more comfortable. But enough stalling. I am here to discuss what happened a few hours ago before anyone comes looking for me. I want to start off by saying I fucking hate people. I live alone, and I prefer it that way. I do my best to avoid any social situation and would much rather pay for overpriced fast food and have it delivered than to go out or stop at a grocery store. But with the constant inflation and the price of fees going up for delivery services, I was stuck having to bite the bullet and go shopping. Work has been slow, so I haven't been making as much money as usual thanks to the corporate gods deeming it necessary to cut my fucking hours. Anyway, I had to hype myself up to crawl in my car and head to the local grocery store to buy food. It's a 10 minute drive from my scummy apartment. I had a total of $60 to spend and hoped that it would last me until my next paycheck. Once I arrived at my destination, I sat in my car for a while and just watched other people come in and out of the establishment known as Willie's Bottom Dollar Grocery. Sixty dollars. What can that buy anyone in this day and age? A bunch of ramen noodles, mac and cheese, and a few other extra bits of bullshit? But I could get more food here than spending it on fast food, which would be enough for maybe two meals off of the cheap menu. After procrastinating for a long while and breathing in the hot air from the non-existent air conditioning of my beat-up Corolla, I finally opened the door and began my walk into the store. The cool air assaulted my sweat-drenched face when the glass door squealed open. The sound was atrocious, but the sensation of the cold helped relax me. My nerves were a jumbled ball from the intense heat wave and the knowledge of having to be in a public place. God, I hate being around people. I was greeted by an elderly woman who was standing guard by the self-checkout area. As if anyone would be intimidated by her. She was short and plump, with tons of wrinkles that I swear moved with the gust of air from the vent above the entrance. I stared for a minute too long at her, and the smile she had soon faded to a scowl. I removed eye contact, letting my gaze lower to her name tag, which indicated that her name was Darlene. She looked more like a Betsy, but whatever. I walked towards the area where they kept the shopping carts. There were two different kinds. The big silver ones with the red plastic handle and the small blue ones with the dingy white rubber wheels. Seeing that I wasn't going to be buying much, I grabbed one of the blue ones. And wouldn't you know, the one I picked had a fucked up wheel that spun and let out an unnerving rumble as I rolled it across the glazed cement floor. God damn it. I can't stand it when the shopping carts are in bad condition. If I had it my way, I would throw the defective ones away. But I was trying to make this a quick trip and really did not want to turn around and get another cart. And there was no way I was walking back towards the wavy, wrinkled flesh goblin. So, to the pasta aisle I went, in a hurry. The rumble of the broken wheel making a loud racket that sent a wave of embarrassment flooding into my psyche. I did my best to avoid any eye contact with people and serpentined around anyone who was moving too slowly. I can't stand that shit. Just move with a purpose, grab what you need and move on. Something about the way other human beings act in a store always drives me up the wall. The stress of it all increases with the time I'm in a store and by the time I'm checking out I have a pounding headache from the high amount of annoyance. Sometimes. I feel like I'm the only one who knows the proper way how to act in any store, and it can be extremely frustrating. So far for this trip, though, nothing had really bothered me too much. That was until I finally made it to aisle nine. 
All I needed from this aisle was maybe six packets of ramen and five boxes of the off-bread of macaroni and cheese. As I made my way to the blue boxes, standing in front of them was a haggard old man. He wasn't doing anything but staring at the boxes and chewing on his cheek like it was a piece of gum or something. I don't know why some old people do that, but I swear I always see it. His back was at a weird arch, and the cane he was holding looked flimsy, not suitable to even hold a toddler up. He was mumbling to himself as he chewed, but he never blinked or lifted his eyes from their fixed position. I stood there for what felt like five minutes more before I made a few steps closer, hoping to reach beyond him and grab my macaroni. But when I got closer to him, good God, the stench. I can't make this up. The man smelled like a dog who had been soaking in a pool of piss and had recently vomited all over itself. The smell made me gag, and I immediately backed away. I decided that I no longer needed to get that item and spun around to grab my cart and leave the aisle. My irritation was beginning to surface, but only a small bit. I was more disgusted than anything. The smell of the old man lingered around until I made it two aisles over in the bread area. I planned to grab a loaf of bread for some good old-fashioned peanut butter sandwiches. Thinking about my first item, I would try to go back for the macaroni and also get some ramen. Hopefully, by the time I was finished in the bread aisle, Mr. Vomit would be gone. With a tight budget, I scanned the shelves for the cheapest brand, which came in a clear bag with red letters that spelled BREAD. I knelt down to grab the nearest loaf when I heard a loud, nasally explosion and felt a wet mist assault my wrist. I screamed inside of my head. What the fuck? As I looked up to see some acne-faced teenagers staring at me with a long trail of snot hanging from his nose. I couldn't move from the shock of what had just happened. I remained in place, but then the kid spoke. Calm down, dude. I'm not, like, sick or anything. I bit down on my bottom lip before speaking my piece. You should really cover your mouth when you sneeze, you know, to avoid spreading germs. I spoke in a slight, sarcastic tone. The kid was old enough to know this, and me having to say it, it just annoyed me. Whatever, dude, the little shit blurted out as he stormed off, flipping me the bird as he did so. Motherfucker. Shit like this is why I hate people. Inconsiderate pricks like that kid and old people who don't know how to take a hint like Mr. Vomit. My stress was starting to boil, and I hadn't even put a single item in my cart. I rubbed my wet arm against my pants and grabbed a loaf of bread, then made my way back to get my macaroni. I would grab the peanut butter after returning to aisle nine. I turned towards the aisle, and would you believe it? Mr. Vomit was still there, standing in the exact same spot and staring into space. Jesus fucking Christ. What goes through people's heads when they do things like this? I was determined to get what I needed, so I said to hell with it and took a deep breath. I held it in as I hastily walked towards the old man and grabbed the off-brand mac and cheese. As I exhaled and walked back to my cart, he muttered in my direction, Cocksucker. I turned around and stared at him. He didn't look at me. Instead, I watched his face begin to turn red, then a grunt reverberated from his clenched jaw. All of a sudden, he let out a wet, disgusting noise that did not come from his mouth. I paused, wondering if he had soiled himself, and soon I received my answer. I thought he smelled bad before, but now it was just otherworldly in its vileness. He turned his head and looked at me, muttering once again, You fucking cocksucker. I had enough of the situation, and left Mr. Vomit to his own filthy atmosphere. I couldn't believe the old man did that and then glared at me while whispering insults. What the hell was going on today? I threw the boxes in my cart and left in a hurry to remove the stench from my nostrils. I pulled out the calculator on my phone to add up the amount of the boxes and single loaf of bread. So far, I was at $6.15, rounding it off with tax. Due to the foul situation, I was only able to grab three boxes instead of five. I decided to skip the ramen since it was apparent the noodle aisle was now off-limits. I was craving something salty, so I decided I would add some pickles to my week of provisions. 
That was the only thing I needed from the condiment aisle which I was currently at, minus a jar of peanut butter. Three dollars for the cheap brand, but the pickles, I couldn't go cheap on those. They had to be the kosher dills, otherwise I wouldn't eat them. It was like a delicacy to me, so they were worth the six dollars. So, in total, that would leave me with roughly forty-five dollars to spend, including tax. I quickly headed to the shelf of multiple brands of pickles and scanned the area until I found the jar filled with those delicious spears. But lo and behold, there was someone in my way once again. A very large woman on a motorized scooter. To be honest, I don't even know how the thing was even able to move. I know, I shouldn't fat shame, but holy hell, I was caught off guard by her size. Although I did not think too hard about insults until I realized she was going to be there for a long time. She was grabbing jars and reading the labels with a large rectangular magnifying glass. Yes, a fucking magnifying glass. What in the hell do you need to look at in such great detail that requires a tool like that? I couldn't even hold in my annoyance at this point. Her slow movements, the heavy breathing from setting one jar down to pick up another, and the wailing of the springs in the poor chair of that scooter. So many things just clawing at my patience. I let out a long sigh and was met with a glare of pure hatred. What? The large woman yelled at me, spit flying from her bright red-colored lips. A drop of saliva landed on my shirt and I could feel heat rising in my chest. I let out another sigh and did my best to remain calm. Ma'am, can you please back up a bit so I can grab what I need? I didn't want to fight, I just wanted my damn pickles. She scoffed at me, then yelled once more. You can wait till I'm done. I am on a diet and need to know the salt levels on every brand so I don't ruin my figure, asshole. She quickly turned her head back to the jar after she spoke. That really pissed me off. What figure, you enormous cow? I thought that in my head, but refrained from vocally insulting the rude woman. She was in a scooter. It would take no effort to push a button or whatever just to move two feet. That's all I asked for. But no, she wasn't having that. I was made to just stand and wait like an idiot. With the other two incidents, my level of patience was growing very thin. I abandoned one food, but I was not leaving this store without my fucking pickles. So I took a deep, calming breath and asked her to move once more. I was met with shouting, more spit, and somehow was accused of being prejudiced toward the disabled. I don't know where that last part came from because I never said anything about a disability or her weight. At least, not out loud. Either way, I was fed up, but did nothing except take a few steps back and wait for the woman to finish her inspection of the ingredients. You know, because the jars are filled with all kinds of chemicals and other bullshit that needs to be examined with a fine-tooth comb. Give me a fucking break. Apparently, she didn't like me standing there and started scoffing and shooting glances of frustration at me, then finally yelled at me for a third time. Do you mind... I can't concentrate with you there. That's in consideration, asshole. I threw my hands up in defeat and placed them on the bar of my cart. I could hear her strained breathing as I made my way to the end of the aisle. I stopped right there after thinking about all that had happened so far. Too many rude interactions that had ruined my shopping experience, and I was done with that. If this lady didn't want to move, then I was going to make her move. I turned around and walked back towards her, leaving my cart behind. Without any hesitation, I grabbed a deluxe jar of off-brand whole pickles and dropped it on top of the woman's skull. It didn't shatter as I expected to. Instead, it made a loud thud sound and kind of bounced off of her head. She squealed like a pig being tortured, and it hurt my ears. I raised the jar above my head and landed four more blows before my arms began to ache. By that time... There was a large stain of red on the edge of the jar and a huge gash on the left side of her scalp. The blood was flowing at a slow pace and blending with her blonde curls, almost dyeing them a faint orange color. She had stopped squealing and fell limp against the handle of the scooter. Her hefty chest blubber had triggered a button that sent the scooter rolling off towards the end of the aisle. 
I had to jump backward to avoid my toes being run over. It slammed into the side of a freezer box that held the frozen burger patties that were on sale. Buy two, get one free. I placed the large jar back on the top shelf and grabbed my kosher dills. I walked back to my cart and placed them gently next to the peanut butter. I walked past the woman, seeing that the wheels of the scooter were still spinning, but the freezer stopped the thing from actually going anywhere. I thought I could smell something burning as I walked towards the canned goods aisle. The rumble of my cart's defective wheel caused a slight vibration that rattled the pickle jar against the metal rack it sat on. I decided to grab a few cans of ravioli and chicken noodle soup. Lucky for me, the name brand was on sale. Four for five dollars, so I got four of each, which brought my new limit to thirty-four dollars. Always got to add the tax, just in case. I felt pretty good about the stuff I had gotten so far. Granted, in this economy, everything is overpriced, but what can you do? With the cans placed neatly in my cart, I decided I needed to get some milk and maybe some cereal. I did the math and figured I could get a gallon of skim milk and two boxes of cereal and maybe have a little money left over for some chocolate and a few other cheap items. I looped around, passing the pasta aisle again, noticing Mr. Vomit was no longer there, but an employee was in his spot, mopping up some green-colored sludge. We can all take a guess on what that was. I was a few steps away from the milk when I watched some big muscle-bound man park his cart in front of the milk. He left it right where I needed to be and just casually walked away. Some people just have no courtesy for anyone these days. He completely left the aisle and wandered off somewhere else. One of the big silver carts packed with cases of water, protein powder, fruit, meat, and a lot of olive oil for some strange reason. I didn't want to give too much thought to it, but... Seven bottles of olive oil? Who does that? Well, I decided that I wasn't going to wait, so I shoved his card a bit aggressively, then opened the door of the fridge to grab my skim milk and placed it in my small blue cart. I heard a crash, and then a deep voice shout, Who the fuck touched my shit? I let out a long sigh and thought to myself, Great, I pissed off Mr. Muscles. He came around the corner with his chest puffed out and a nasty vein poking out of the side of his tree trunk neck. His eyes were wide and shifting towards his cart, then at me. I was the only one around, so there was no doubt he knew I was the culprit. Anyone ever tell you not to touch people's shit? He snarled. My heart raced a bit as he walked towards me. I stood there frozen and apologized. My quivering voice gave it away that he intimidated me with his size and stature. He lifted me up by my shirt collar and threatened me a few times, then called me a pansy before dropping me and telling me to watch myself. I landed on my ass when he dropped me, which hurt, but I didn't let it show. As I got to my feet, he locked eyes with me one more time, then stormed towards a different aisle. Hulk Hogan wannabe motherfucker. I muttered under my breath. I had my milk, so the next destination was towards cereal. One of the more expensive items in this rundown grocery store. I left the aisle, rubbing my ass to attempt to dull the pain. I grew up eating things like Cocoa Puffs, Frosted Flakes, and Fruity Pebbles. However, in those days, the boxes were like two bucks a pop. Now it costs fucking seven dollars for a small box of name brand cereal. So I was stuck with either the watered-down flavored stuff in a flimsy box or the shit in the large bag that gets soggy after ten seconds of being coated in milk. But at least I could get more than one thing for less than fifteen dollars. A box of Fruity O's and a bag of Cocoa Diamonds for a total of twelve dollars. I felt lucky because after all of what I got, I still had roughly seventeen dollars left to spend. Realizing my fate, I went back to the condiment aisle to get a jar of grape jelly as a bonus to buy sandwiches for the week. And who did I see once I got there? The little prick who sneezed on me. My luck increased at this, so I grabbed my jelly, placed it in my cart, then grabbed strawberries in one of those glass jars and sprinted towards the teenager. He didn't notice me until after I had stopped a few feet away and thrown the jar at him. The jar bounced off his face and shattered near him. 
He fell to the floor, crying and demanding to know why I had done that. I took what was left of the broken jar and dug it into his eye socket, but stopped after accidentally stabbing my thumb with a jagged edge of broken glass. I cursed, then rose to my feet and began stomping on his neck until the scream stopped and I heard a crunch. A lady walked in the aisle and yelped when she saw us, then ran away, yelling for help. I wiped my thumb on my shirt, leaving a small stain on it. I grabbed my cart to continue shopping. At this point, I was kind of just roaming around looking for anything that looked good. The jelly dropped my money to basically $11, so I had no idea what to even get. Even for the cheap stuff, jelly was kind of expensive. I saw the big muscle man as I wandered, and I avoided him by darting into the opposite aisle. This one was filled with bags, aluminum foil, Tupperware, and utensils. I spotted a knife set, grabbed a rather large one, and stared at it. I envisioned myself assaulting Mr. Muscles and getting revenge. I gripped the handle tightly and ripped the thin plastic to free the wide metal blade. I left my card in that aisle and headed towards where I saw the big man, plotting how I would attack him. He was aimlessly wandering around looking at different types of soup, and once again he had left his cart in the middle of the aisle as he strayed away from it. Fuck this asshole. That's what I thought to myself as I glared at the cloud of a man, watching the fluorescent light reflecting off of his bald head. It looked like he shined it with wax every morning as he lifted weights, playing Roadhouse in the background. He hadn't noticed me there, and eventually he lined up perfectly with his cart, and I shoved it as hard as I could. It sped towards him, slamming into his waist and sending him falling to the floor. He let out a winded shout, Who the fuck? I leaped onto his chest and placed my knees on his shoulders. His eyes grew as big as dinner plates when he saw the knife in my hand. His voice became a trembling whine of pleading, but I ignored the words as I started jabbing the blade in any area it decided to penetrate. I lost count after maybe 15 or 16 stabs. Once I felt the burn in my arm and Mr. Muscles was no longer squirming, I jammed the blade in one more time before getting up and pushing my cart to the next aisle. That incident was a torrent of blind rage, and to be honest, I don't have any idea where I stabbed him or where I left that knife. I know I'd lodged it somewhere, though, and it stuck. The front left wheel of my cart rolled into the growing puddle of blood, and I created a narrow trail as I walked away. I still had not found anything that caught my fancy to spend my remaining dollars on. But then I made it to the candy aisle and that changed. For nostalgic reasons, I searched for the classic white chocolate bar. You know, the Zero Bar. A bit hypocritical of me, but I abandoned my car to check out the variety of candy. I had no luck finding my preferred treat, so I stood there pondering a good substitute. My concentration was broken by the sound of a woman yelling on the phone. She had the damn thing on speaker, and the other person was just as loud but with that somewhat static tone. The two were bickering about which summer house to stay in or something along those lines. She walked past and clipped me with her ugly but no doubt expensive purse, not even acknowledging my existence. I ignored it and continued with my thoughts. I don't care, Daryl. I want to go to South Carolina this year. Fuck Roger and his fat wife. They're not coming to that condo. And if Sharon has an issue, then I'll... Her voice was beyond obnoxious. The conversation was rattling my brain, and I felt a migraine forming in my skull. This lady was driving me insane, and she had only been near me for a good 60 seconds. She refused to shut up, or at least have the decency to quiet her tone. No one wants to hear your entire conversation couldn't tune out the sound and I just quickly grabbed the nearest wrapper and walked towards my cart. I didn't really know what I grabbed, but chocolate is chocolate, so I didn't care. I just needed to get out of the aisle and away from the sound. Three paces away and this blabbering hag was standing right in front of my cart. Daryl! Daryl! Shut up! Yes, yes, you pay for it, but it is mine. She spoke with that rich, snooty tone. 
I couldn't take it anymore, and I snatched the phone from her hand and threw it down on the floor. She gasped as the thing broke into multiple pieces. Huh? You son of a bitch! I'm getting security! You don't know who you're dealing with! She screamed and began shuffling away. I grabbed the lady by her hair and slammed her face into the shell filled with baking supplies. A bag of flour burst open and coated the woman's face in white powder. I continued to bounce her face on the shelf until that white turned red. She gasped for air, and I let her drop to the floor. The sound of her skull hitting the concrete made a sound that made my stomach ache. She whimpered, and I picked up the broken pieces of her phone and shoved them in her mouth. She fought, but it was no use. I kicked her in the face a few times, and I'm pretty sure she may have swallowed one of the broken pieces. I decided that was enough and went to the next aisle to spend my last eight dollars. I realized I grabbed a king-size Snickers, which was three dollars. I ended up having to loop around back to the aisle and double-check the price. The loud woman was still on the ground, and I couldn't tell if she was dead or unconscious. There was blood pooling around her head and some leaking from the corner of her mouth, however. But that was not my problem, so I moved on. I was feeling like maybe some Pop-Tarts would go well with my assortment of snacks. Name-brand Pop-Tarts run almost $5 a box, but lucky for me, the cheap stuff had a sale going on, two for six. So I was able to get a box of cinnamon and cookies and cream. I was pretty excited about that. After doing the math, I realized adding in the tax that I had officially reached my budget of provisions, so I spun around to go check out. As I went past the aisles, I saw people rushing past me. I'm sure they were headed to help the morons that pissed me off. I heard a man shout, Call an ambulance! She's still breathing! I wondered if they were referring to the lady on the scooter or the one who swallowed pieces of her phone. I continued walking toward the front of the store, another person shouting about a giant mess in aisle five. I opted out of the normal checkout lanes because no one was there, no doubt scrambling to take hold of the situation. So I headed to the self-checkout kiosk where the wrinkled goblin was still stationed. I casually began ringing up my items and she rushed towards me. Sir, make sure to scan your items one at a time. I ignored her and continued scanning the barcodes. She spoke again. Make sure to use your advantage card if you have one. I placed my kosher dills in the bag then turned to her. I don't have one. The woman with the name tag Darlene looked at me in disappointment and started telling me that I should get a rewards card. I declined, but she then started describing the process. I said, again, that I was not interested, but it seemed to go through one ear and out the other. She grabbed my arm and looked me in the eyes as she told me I really needed to sign up for the store's bullshit card. I didn't say a word as I drew back and punched her square in the jaw. Her eyes rolled back and a mixture of blood and saliva shot from her mouth. I'm pretty sure I watched a tooth fly out as well. I was right when I heard it clink on the floor. She started to groan, her head bobbing as she tried to lift herself up. I scanned another item, then kicked her a few times in the ribs until she collapsed. I placed the last item in a bag and looked at the total displayed on the screen. $54.97 was the total. Holy shit! A smile cracked across my face when I saw that, and I thought to myself, under budget, this has turned out to be a good day. I put all the bags in the cart and strolled outside to load my trunk up with my haul. I could hear shouts of panic as the glass doors squealed shut behind me. Last thing I heard was, Oh my lord, that man attacked poor Darlene! I kept walking and didn't miss a beat until I got to my car. After I put my cart in the rail thing, I got in my car and started driving out of the parking lot. I stopped when someone slowly walked out of the door. An old man with a cane. Son of a bitch. I thought the words and said them out loud. It was Mr. Vomit, slowly shuffling to his vehicle with a bag that looked like it had maybe two items. I looked behind me to check if there were any cars. All clear. So I backed up a wee bit then put the car in drive and slammed on the gas. The engine revved and the RPM needle bounced furiously. Soon, a loud thud sent a rattle to the front end as I watched the old geezer roll across my hood, windshield, and then fly over my car. 
I saw his body land on the asphalt through my rearview mirror. He hit hard. His body was limp with no movement whatsoever. He had left a slight crack in my windshield accompanied by a splatter of blood. I pressed my foot on the brake and put the car in reverse, gunning it hard and feeling the lift of the tire as it rolled over the old man. I repeated the process but switched to drive and ran over him one last time before finally leaving the parking lot of Willie's Bottom Dollar Grocery. I took care of the final annoyance of my shopping experience and drove home with a smile on my face. During my drive, I saw an ambulance and two squad cars speed past me. I'm sure it is no surprise where they were heading. I made it home and cooked some macaroni and cheese, then accented the dish with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The sight of Mr. Vomit's mangled corpse filled my head as I ate, but surprisingly, it didn't deter my hunger. I feel like the events of today were out of the ordinary, and something compelled me to share it, so that is why I typed all of this out. All of this happened about two hours ago, and now I think... I hear sirens. That might be for me, so I'll end this. Just wanted to share my story. Has anyone else ever had a day like this? I hope you enjoyed Shopping on a Budget, as written by Mike Mann and performed by Kevin Barbary. On to the shows. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. And don't forget to check out the Fear from the Heartland archives, featuring more than 120 episodes. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure... Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>